not a nice area like where we live. <clears throat> it's just far from the country, yeah. But that house was cold. That we lived in out there, it was not well insulated. Oh, really? It was a cold house. <clears throat> but it had a lot of big rooms and stuff for kids to play around in. Yeah. 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 Dad would send the boys out to the barn. Because every Saturday he'd get up and make them go out to the barn. I don't know why they just didn't go do it, but <laughs> <laughs> he had to make them. He had to make them. You know, tell them. Well, you know, uh, those are nice memories when you can go far back. Uh -huh. Being born in a place. Well, it was a nice area out here, of course, because there were a bunch of kids out there, and we'd get up on the hills and play and. We, in the summer, Morning. almost every day, we walk in Morning. here to the swimming pool. What are you huffing and puffing? I, I walked a mile. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> Oh, did you walk? I parked, no, I parked over at the school. Oh, oh okay. okay. So, hey, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> well, they took the yellow tape down now. Yeah, yeah they, they, they did. did on it now, so. I guess they called and he said, no, it's okay. Park yeah. Here. Too late now. I'll have to just walk back. <laughs> Where does everybody sit? You got assigned seats? No. 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 <laughs> Wherever you'd like to. I was always at a table. You're not teaching. How was your week? Oh, it you was uh, uneventful. Oh, you're not teaching. You're not teaching. Oh, you're oh, last year. Oh, good. Good. Did you lose all your class? Well, you yes, I did. Someone. They all went downstairs, but I retired. Oh, you oh, retired. Okay. So are there any kids going to be in that class now? Well, I don't know if the milliners are coming, but their little boy would be. Okay. And, um, Joey? Uh, is it Joey? No, he no. went downstairs. Would oh. Sam be? Is Sam old enough to be in that Sam class? would be. How are you doing, sir? And, and uh, the you. Smith boy, How are you Bo. Doing? Would Bo be oh, in Bo. that room? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are Good you? Good morning. I feel left so out. Take that, <laughs> you took that down so too quick. So who's taking the class <laughs> here, Lee? <laughs> we had to walk a mile. <laughs> <laughs> we parked down there too. <laughs> we parked over to school. Yeah. I didn't even know they did anything to But I thought, boy, if they can't get on that, that's half our parking. Yeah. Yep. Well, it looks like they're getting on it now. So. Well, Maybe there was a one call I missed them. Well, about it. Glenn no. just said either she called or they called. Said it was okay. Okay. So she had Doug her hurry up and get her car parked. <laughs> Good. It looks nice. Well, bright. And fresh. Out. Huh? She wore herself out walking. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Mary Lane. <laughs> Do I have to give for you again today, or did you? Uh -huh. Oh, you collected this class? Boy, I'll tell you. Yeah, Rita told me you should be good to your mother. She did? And that's, yeah. what the, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> <laughs> Bible says this lady. Oh, do you mind stopping? I, I just need to get something here at Bob Evans. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Orders in and he says, that'll be thirty six fifty two. Oh, and she goes, no she goes oh, I forgot, I forgot my, my money and her money. Could you, could you take care of that? I'm not too dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I cannot believe all this. Uh, yeah, she... And that not once, not twice. No, 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 no. I start, you know, used to say, did you get your door locked? Now I say, did you get your purse? <laughs> and then he says, <clears throat> zipper number one, zipper number two. Oh, yeah. And then he would probably say, I got it, Mom. I yes, it. I, yes. Uh, <laughs> he just wants to make me suffer a little yeah. bit. <laughs> well, really, you know, and, Huh? You know him after the oh, I deal, nothing surprised Yeah, you. I had a husband. <laughs> <laughs> I had a husband like that and his son. A double whammy. <laughs> I guess I keep them both, though. <laughs> but I got a son, too, you know. Yeah. So I'll get 
get it, Mom. I'll get it. <laughs> Oops. Good morning. The door closes. You can't come in. <laughs> She's going to say, if you slam that door in my face, I'll just go somewhere else. <laughs> Good morning. Good to have you with us this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. And trust that uh, you've had a good day so far. We didn't kick the cat or, or uh, chase the dog or yell at your wife or <laughs> throw the pan at your husband. Frying pan. Uh, good day in the Lord. Amen. Good to have you with us today. Thanks for those that are joining us online as well. Glad to have you with us. And. Uh, uh, what a great week we've had this past week, and looking forward to another good one. Supposed to be nice weather the rest of this week. Good rain yesterday. And, yes. Uh, so, it uh, looks like uh, we're heading down the home path. My mom and I, we watched the sunrise every morning. Finally moved behind the trees. Uh -huh. It's going to be gone until next spring. Uh -huh. That's a hard thing to, you know, every day you see it moving mm -hmm. this way. And now it's behind the trees. So we can imagine in our mind what it is. But it's the hint of fall coming and uh, don't want to push it too much. But, uh, beautiful weather that we're having. And uh, got the church picnic coming up next week. So looking forward to that. Uh, come dressed in your uh, overalls and blue jeans or ready to go to have a good time at the picnic and pray that the weather will cooperate with us. Everybody's got everything in place and every plan is made, every dot's dotted and every T's crossed, and, right? Yes. Yes. So it uh, looks like we'll have a good time. Uh, well, anybody have a special uh, blessing this past week and you just can't hardly wait to share it? Anybody? Something special for you? Well, we've been. Um, <laughs> We're alive. <laughs> <laughs> We're alive. That's a good blessing. We've been uh, studying in uh, this class principles of biblical study. How do we study the Bible to get from the Bible, not what we want or what someone else wants us to get, but how do we get from the Bible what the Bible says? And uh, so we've come across several principles, and each one of them independently is important. But the greatest importance is all of them together. And uh, today, our uh, focus on the principle of biblical numerics. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Great. How are you doing? Good. Doing. So we're, we're studying uh, the principles of biblical numerics. And as uh, we've talked about these uh, principles, uh, there's about 21 principles. And um, Matt, and through your wife there, We've been studying these principles, the 21 principles in the Bible. How, how do we know when we read the Bible and study it that we're getting what God intended for us? I mean, if you've ever listened to Christian radio or watched Christian television, so-called, so there are about 55 different messages you can get. Everybody has an opinion about something. And, uh, you know, I love my mom most of the time. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, She's a really sweet lady most of the time, and, uh, but, and, and she's the one that introduced me to Jesus by her life and by the scriptures, but I, I don't want to rely upon my mom's sincerity and my love for her and just say, okay, she must have the truth, because that gets dangerous because all of a sudden you start associating truth with a person rather than truth with God's Word. So how do we know when we are studying the Bible that what we read and study is really what the Bible says? So there's these 21 principles, and we've gone through a number of them already. These 21 principles are like a, a, a filtering system or a grid that if we apply these principles to every time we study the Bible and read it, uh, these principles, if they all agree... They give us the understanding of Scripture. And uh, some of the principles that we talked about were ethnic principle. And uh, there's three classes of people in the Bible. 
Gentiles, Jews, and Christians, or Church of God. And so it's important when we're reading the Bible to say, okay, who, who's being addressed here? Jews, Gentiles, or church, okay? There's the principle of context. You know, uh, if you're married and you have been married, you understand how important context is, <laughs> you know. Um, my wife, every once in a while, she'll say to me, I can't believe you said that. I said, well, you, you took that sentence and that statement right out of the whole story. It, it was supposed to be packaged in the whole story. Then I'm in the doghouse for about a month and a half, and uh, she finally lets me back out. But So context is important so that you know what's written before and what's written afterwards. These are real important things to consider. Well, there's a lot of them. We've gone through several of them. Uh, one of the uh, principles is, is the type or the picture. Um, I'm often re uh, reminded of uh, Jesus saying, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Listen to his words. Even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So the picture of the uh, Moses when the nation of Israel was be, being bitten by a bunch of serpents in Numbers chapter 24, and Moses said, God, what am I going to do? These people are dying. He said, take a pole, fashion the serpent out of brass on top of the pole, and tell the people that if they get by, bit by the serpent, that they all have to do is look to the serpent, and they'll live. So that serpent and that pole in the Old Testament under Moses is a picture of Jesus Christ who was raised up on a pole, a cross, and if you look to him for salvation, you can be saved. So there's a lot of these are in the Bible. In fact, uh, Mary Lane, this is her first week with us here. Uh, as she surrenders her, let's see, you were there for... Um, Six or seven years. <laughs> okay. As a Sunday school class, a lot of the Sunday school literature, uh, no matter where you get it from, are all almost exclusively pictures or types of taking an Old Testament example and seeing Jesus through it. So one of the ways of studying the Bible is just to look for these pictures or these types, uh, these examples. And so... Uh, that's one of the principles, and there's 21 of them. We've gone through uh, about six, and right now, one of those principles is biblical numerics. Um, if you're not real familiar with the study um, of biblical numerics, it may seem a little far-fetched, but it, it, it's interesting that God has, if you think about it, it makes sense. He's the creator of the universe, right? And what are one of the things that we talk about that holds it all together. The laws of the universe. There's the law of thermodynamics. There's the law of gravity. There's all these different things. All of these are mathematics. If you if you boil it right down to, it's all about math mathematics. And so God, who is the creator, is huge on math and calculations and the knowledge of numbers. And so it shouldn't seem strange to us that there are patterns in the Bible about numerics. We looked at uh, uh, some of the most familiar ones, number three, and that is the picture of Trinity or Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you find this trilogy throughout the Bible, the number three coming up to illustrate God's stamp of approval upon something, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all bearing witness to the same thing. So you have this trilogy all through the Bible. And uh, we looked at the number five. Uh, five is another one. We've looked at all of them, but I'm just picking out some. Five is another example of uh, numbers in the box, consistent all the way through. And uh, Jesus, uh, five in the Bible represents death and grace. So Jesus died, uh, his death, D-E-A-T-H, all right, gave us grace, G-R-A-C-E. And through his death and grace, we received M-E-R-S-C-Y, mercy. And so you have these pictures all through the Bible, these numbers of five come up. You examine Jesus on the cross, how many wounds did he have? One, two, three, four, and then they pierced his side, five. All the way in the Old Testament, when anybody was pursuing one another, do you remember it says that he stabbed him? And do you remember what rib it was? Fifth rib. It's, I mean, it's, it's consistent all through the Bible. These things come up. And so, uh, as we look at the Bible, we see these patterns of these numbers, and it helps us to understand. It's just one part of the fabric 
that we use to ascertain what it is that God wanted intentionally for us to see through the pattern. Uh, number seven was another one. Seven is the number of completion. All right, And uh, God created the heaven and the earth in six days. He rested on the seventh. Seventh, complete, done, over with, perfect. And so seven all the way through the Bible is consistent of complete perfection. And we get it in many different things. So we've come through these numbers. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So everything in our life goes in sevens, right? Uh, we have uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then we start all over again. That's the eighth day. New beginnings. That's what it is in the Bible is new beginnings. And this is all the way through the Bible. Uh, it's, it's active in our life. Uh, there are how many notes? Seven notes. When you start the next note, it's the next octave. So it repeats every seven. It repeats. Who's the creator of music? All right. And that is the Lord. So these sevens uh, and eight, eighth new beginning. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 or 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new beginning. We get a new chance of life in Christ Jesus. So these numbers are important. And again, it's not, we're not going to rest our entire belief system on the numbers. But the numbers are important to give us the overall view of how do we know when we study the Bible that we're forgiven. Um, all of us probably have been uh, through our life. Someone has come to us and said, oh, oh, that's wrong. What we believe. This is right. So how do we know? And that's, this is what we're using these principles to ascertain. Well, uh, last week we ended... Uh, the number eight, New Beginnings, and today we begin number nine, and uh, we'll spend some time looking at number nine and the parallels of Scripture that open up to us our understanding of this great number in the Bible. Before we do, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much today for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, life in Christ Jesus, for you being active in our life and the choices of our life. We thank you, Lord, for the great things that you're doing in our church, uh, the great things you're doing in our lives. And, uh, Lord, we look forward to the opportunity to be able to um, bear witness to you in a way that the world will acknowledge and understand. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for being our Savior. Bless us and help us as we study today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the number nine, uh, number nine is the last of the single numbers in our numbering system, uh, completing the single di digit sequence. The number speaks of fruitfulness, fruitfulness, and I hope that we'll be able to see this pretty clearly as we look at scripture this morning. Nine is one more than the new beginning, eight, right, uh, which is eight. So after we get saved, we should be what? fruitful. All right, so eight is new beginning, and nine is fruitful. When we get saved, we should be fruitful. Fruitful in many things, fruitful in giving. Uh, a nine is what is kept after we give God the tenth. All right, so we get nine tenths, he gets one tenth, and what does that, what does that do for us? It says, have you, you've always you've all heard of the sowing and reaping principle. Let's look at it. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Second Corinthians chapter nine. And look at verse number six. And this is a this is a a principle that's so easy to understand. Uh, we live out in the country, Matt. You've been out there. We got fields all around us, and I always get excited because I didn't grow up in the country, so it's, it's more interest to me. But it's interesting, they put one seed in the ground, and if you just got one seed harvested from that, who would farm? No one. You couldn't, couldn't afford to do that. But what's the principle? You put one in, and God gives you many more. Now, this is a biblical principle. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly 
shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the principle is, is that the more you sow, the more you reap. And God always gives us more than what we sow. This is the principle in the Bible. And so when we think of tithing, which is a, a principle in Christian giving, is that we give a tenth of what God's given to us, and he gives us the bounty of nine-tenths afterwards. So it's the idea of being fruitful. Uh, early on in my Christian life, of course, I grew up in, uh, nine, as I've said before, nine months before I started, uh, well, before I was born, I was attending church. Uh, my mom carried me all the way through. And uh, so there are so many things in the Christian life I just took for granted that after I got saved, it was real easy for me. And one of those was about giving to the Lord. And a lot of people struggle with that. I understand uh, sometimes we put ourselves in such a situation that it's hard for us to give. Uh, but, but giving, uh, there's this principle is that you know, part of this belongs to the Lord. That's what he asked for me to do, and I just do it. <laughs> and if you get in the habit of doing that, you know, you don't like watch the offering plate as it goes down the row. So, you, know, uh, you know, or you know, you ask the usher, do you make change? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, you give my nickel and he says four cents back or something. Yeah. But so after a while you get so used to that, it is a part of your life, and you realize that you receive fruitfulness in your giving. And God's promise is you give one and uh, or you give one to me and I give nine back. So nine nine is the number of fruitfulness. In fact, even this, although this is an Old Testament example, look at Malachi. Malachi chapter um, last book in the New Testament or Old Testament. Malachi chapter three and uh, look at verse ten. <laughs> Malachi three and verse ten And in the Old Testament, uh, it wasn't voluntary to tithe. It was mandated, okay? In the Old Testament, a Jew was to give a tenth of everything. A tenth of the harvest, a tenth of his family, a tenth of everything, okay? Uh, this is a, that's an important thing in the Old Testament. If you didn't, you were in trouble, okay? So we're not going to put that kind of pressure in the New Testament because... In the New Testament, God changed it from being an obligation to a voluntary thing. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, As a man purposeth in his heart, so let him give. <clears throat> and one of the struggles in a Christian life, especially new converts, is this principle of giving. And um, God allows for the purpose of not being mandatory but voluntary so the person can prove the Lord <clears throat> and those of us who have been saved for a while and got the principle understand you can't outgive the Lord no matter how much you give you can't outgive him he always gives back more but that's good preaching it's just hard living okay so you have to learn that you, it's a principle that you gain by uh, experiencing it but look at uh, Malachi chapter 3 in the Old Testament it was mandatory and you bore the, uh, the reproach of sin if you didn't do this. And notice it uh, as it's brought here in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Now listen. Prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he said if you prove me I'll open the windows of heaven. I'm going to show you, if you take the first step of faith to do what I've asked, I'm going to do something for you that you, you, you can't calculate. And that's, uh, in the Old Testament, it was mandated. In the New Testament, uh, it's voluntary. But fruitful. Uh, number nine is about fruitful in giving. Uh, it's fruitful in redemption as well. Uh, look at Mark chapter 15. Matthew, Mark Mark 15, and notice this is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, there's a lot of, I don't know how many of you have, since we've been doing this study, 
there's so many things we read in the Bible that we never even see the numbers until someone mentions the numbers and then we go, oh, how about that? I never saw that before. Mark chapter 15 and look at verse 34. Mark 15 and verse number 34. Jesus is on the cross. He's been on the cross for a while. He's near death. And in verse 34, he says, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What hour was it? Nine. The ninth hour. <laughs> okay. So, what did he say that just before he gave up the ghost and died? And what was accomplished when he did that? Redemption. He redeemed us through his death. And so nine is the number of fruitfulness. He died for us to give us life. All right? And so this is an important uh, passage of Scripture. Look at verse 37. Jesus cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost. The veil in the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. So in the tabernacle of the Lord in the Old Testament, there, there was the big outside tabernacle, uh, just like a fence, we'd call it a fence, and there was only one door. You had to come through the front to get in there. And the first thing you saw when you walked in there was this huge altar just covered with blood. That's where they sacrificed all the animals. And they sacrificed those animals as a substitution. So let's say Rob uh, thought a bad thought this last week. He was a Jew. He would bring uh, a lamb or a, a pigeon or, or something to the, the priest. The priest would slice the throat of that and pour the blood over the altar, and then burn that on the altar. And the priest would say, I'm going to take the lamb instead of you. You're the one that committed the sin. You deserve to die, but someone is going to be substituted for what you did and take the blame for you. This was all a picture of who? Who took the blame for us? Jesus, Jesus on the cross. All right? And so the Old Testament picture, the first, you have this big fence all the way around the tabernacle came in there, that's the first thing you saw, is there's, there's a judgment for sin. Someone has to pay for the sin. Either you, me, or someone else. And as a Christian, that's where we gain our great joy and faith, is that Christ paid for us. He paid the penalty, so I don't have to pay it. All right? So then as you go through there, there's inside this huge fence, there is another house. It's a building, if you would. And it had two compartments. And the first compartment you walked into had this big, long curtain. And a priest could go in there, and there was a table of showbread on the one side, the candle stick on the other side, and um, then that altar of incense in there. And the priest would go in there, and they do that. In fact, if you remember reading in Luke chapter 1, where Zacharias, it was his course to serve. Priests did this as, like, you know, we call it, split shift. Uh, that's what they did. They went in there, and he was a long time in there, and they said, what in the world's going on? And then when he came out, he couldn't speak. And that's when the angel Gabriel came down and said, your wife's going to bear a son, and his name is going to be John. So what he was doing is he was making sure that the incense was lit in that s section there, and any priest could go in there. But beyond that, there's another large curtain, and it was woven straight all the way across, and only one time a year could a priest and only the high priest go into that, and that's where the uh, uh, mercy seat of where God dwelt in between the seraphim. And he would go in there one time a year with the blood sacrifice and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and God would look at the sacrifice of innocent blood for the guilty and he would be satisfied. When Jesus died on the cross and gave up the ghost, as it's written right here in verse 38, it is that last curtain that was ripped right in half. It was such a holy place that when the high priest went in every year, they tie a rope onto his ankle. And his gown, this big like uh, uh, robe that you wear for choir, had bells on it. And so the whole time he was in there, he'd move like this, and the people on the outside could hear the bells ringing. And if the bells ever stopped ringing, they would pull the rope and say, God wasn't, he wasn't satisfied with the blood. I mean, it's a holy place. When we think about that, you know, we're so casual in our 
relationship with the Lord because of grace that we forget what it was like in the Old Testament under such mandates. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he gave up the ghost, and that temple, that curtain ripped in half and exposed the mercy seat, the holy place, and anyone could look in there. Everyone knew that was anything to do with Judaism knew something happened because they did they weren't killed. Do you remember when they were moving the Ark of the Covenant? And Uzzah put his hand up because he wanted to he thought it was going to tip over and he put his hand up. God killed him right there. Uh, we, it's hard for us to have that concept of the things that God has that are holy. And so when Jesus died on the cross, you remember this the Jews, the Romans were the hand, but the Jews were the voice. When Pilate said, would you rather I release Barabbas or Jesus? They said, release Barabbas. His blood be upon us and our children forever. That's what the Jews said. I mean, they're the ones that, that nailed the nail in the coffin, so to speak. And when Jesus died on the cross and that veil ripped it from top to bottom, so it couldn't be done by man, bottom to the top, Man might have been able to do that, but from the top to the bottom, no, no, you couldn't do that. And this wasn't uh, uh, linen. <laughs> this is thick material. And it ripped supernaturally from the top to the bottom, exposed the Holy of Holies, where they could see the mercy seat. Every Jew knew something had happened. And so I say one of the things that happened, we know now, is where before we did not have access to, to where God dwelt, the Holy of Holies. Because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, when I ask Christ to be my Savior, I have access to God the Father. I mean, that's an amazing thing that took place when I asked Christ to be my Savior. And so we see this ninth hour is when this all happened. Nine is the number of fruitfulness. Where before I was separated from God, now I can be fruitful because of what God did for me. Fruitful in redemption. Look at Luke ch chapter 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 23. Uh, Luke 23. And look at verse number 45. Excuse me, 44. This takes us a step before what we were just reading about. We looked at the last, right, of Jesus on the cross. This is three hours earlier. Okay, three hours earlier, one of the thief on one side, thief on the other side, and the one thief said, remember me when you enter into paradise. And look at it right here. <clears throat> Verse 43, Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. <laughs> so you have darkness, the ninth hour, redemption, redemption is complete. And now we can be fruitful. Fruitful in redemption. Uh, this may seem a little confusing. How, how can when someone die, <laughs> it be fruitful? Okay. Well, this takes us right back to where we started about sowing and reaping. All right. Janet's a longtime farmer. What happens to the seed when you put it in the ground? It grows. Before it, it grows, first. what's it do? It dies. It yeah. dies. All right, let's look at this. This is real uh, beautiful in the picture uh, given to us in Scripture. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And look at John chapter 12, verse number 24. Jesus is the one that's speaking here. <clears throat> and he says a principle that we know practically, but often we think, uh, you know, oh, that's in the Bible? You know, it's, oh, surprise, surprise. You know. Uh, uh, John chapter 12. <clears throat> look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. There it is. It has to die first. In order to give life, it has to die. In order for Jesus to give us life, he had to die. That's the reason when Peter's writing, he's saying, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. Jesus was the seed. And he died for us to give us life. And so, <clears throat> this principle is an important thing uh, about death, gives us life. 
And it's pictured in the Old Testament. And this takes us back to one of the other principles we talked about just a few minutes ago about one of the pictures or one of the principles of Bible study is to look and see, is there any picture in the Old Testament of a New Testament truth? Okay. And, well, there is. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Way back in the beginning. Genesis 17. Genesis 17, and uh, let's look at verse 1. Now, where you're looking, it's kind of interesting. I don't want you to think I'm entirely crazy, just partially, okay, partially crazy. But the numbers, the consistency on the patterns of the numbers often go beyond just the text itself, but even the chapters and the verses, the numbers is consistent. So we're going to look at chapter 17 of Genesis, verse 1. So look at those three numbers. 1, 7, 1. Add them up. 9. Okay? So it's interesting how there, there are things beyond what we would even conceive, and we'd almost think, that's impossible. But it's consistent throughout the Bible uh, here. In Genesis 17, verse 1, what does it say? And when Abraham was how many years old? 90. <laughs> 90 years old and 9... The Lord appeared in Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. All right, so he's 99, and what's he going to do? Verse 2, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will, what's multiply? Another word for multiply. Fruitful. <laughs> multiply thee exceedingly. Well, what was the issue? You all remember what the issue was. Abraham's 99 years old. He's got a whole flock of kids, right? No, he has no kids. And the covenant is that God was going to give him a child, a kid. Fruitful. And it's, again, this is a picture. Now, this is what's interesting. Because this illustrates the principle of the wheat corn has to die first, okay? This is deep. Are y'all ready? Okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter, how old was he? 99. 99. Now, I don't know about you, but I have heard that the older that you get as a woman and as a couple, the older that you get, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the more dangerous it is to have children. Correct? Am I right in that? Okay. This is not my... I have a lot of knowledge in this area. Okay. But, uh, my, my, <laughs> okay. but my, my understanding is, is that the older that you get, the more risk there is of having children. In fact, there comes a period of time... Again, this is not my area of expertise at all. There comes a period of time when bearing a child is not physically possible. Am I correct? Okay. All right. I wasn't looking at the men for the nod. I was looking at the woman. Okay. All right. The area of expertise rests in them. All right. So, Romans chapter 4. Did I tell you the chapter? Okay. Notice this interesting thing in Romans chapter 4. Look at verse nine, uh, uh, 19. Speaking of Abraham and speaking about God telling him he's going to have a child... Look what it says. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. dead. So the principle in the Old Testament of Abraham having, uh, uh, being fruitful at 99, not just 90, but 99, two nines, <laughs> to illustrate the fact that we can be fruitful, but in being fruitful, there first has to be a death. And so Abraham was considered dead, and his wife Sarah dead, not physically, but in their ability to bear children. And God said, at 99, I'm going to make you fruitful. In fact, go back to Genesis chapter 17 again. Genesis chapter 17. I should have just told you to stay there, right? Nobody's throwing anything at me. This is a dangerous area. And they throw in all sorts of things. Don't I look fatter? I do. <laughs> uh, Genesis 17, 
And notice, if you would, in verse 4, he's talking about this covenant and this promise that he's making with Abraham, God. And verse 4, and it says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a what? Oh, fruitful. <laughs> fruitful. Of how many? Many nations. Fruitfulness. So the picture is in the Old Testament so clear. Using the first mention principle, which is uh, one of the principles we talked about is the ethnic principle, the context principle, uh, the Old Testament picture or type principle. Another one is the first mention principle. It's an interesting thing. I, I don't know if you've studied much about this, but a verse, a phrase, a word, an idea that is first mentioned in the Bible and the context of how it's mentioned usually is threaded all the way through the Bible. It's the same all the way through. So in our Bible study, one of the things that we do is say, where's the first time this word or this phrase or this idea is ever mentioned in the Bible using an old-fashioned concordance? <clears throat> and when you find it in there, find the context of what it says, it usually gives you a picture of what that word or that phrase is going to be through the rest of the Bible. It's amazing, really. Okay, So one of the things that we do when we're studying is using the first mention principle. <clears throat> now, the first mention principle, again, what's nine, what are we saying nine represents the Bible? Fruitfulness, right? So the first place that it's found in the Bible is Genesis chapter 5. Aren't you glad you weren't in Revelation? Uh, they would really be throwing things at me if that had dropped go from one end of the Bible to the other. Revelation chapter, excuse me, Genesis chapter number 5. <clears throat> And in Genesis chapter 5, in verse 5, Genesis 5, verse 5, all the days that Adam lived were 900, and then there's a, a 30 after that, 930. But focus on how they separate 900 and the 30. It's always the focus is on the 900. In fact, if you look down through here, uh, uh, look at verse 7. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, verse 8. And all the days of Seth were... And then look down here at uh, verse 11. All the days of Enos were... Now look back down here at verse 14. All the days of Canaan were... Now this is interesting because if you look at that verse, and we could go on down, but I'll spare you looking at each one. But if you look at the verse, what happens after their 900 and whatever it is birthday? What's the last word? They die. They die. They die. But look at the verse prior to it. Look at verse 4. What is the context of verse 4? What's it talking about? Children fruitfulness. <laughs> fruitfulness. So again, as you look down, the first mention principle of the Bible, the first time 9 shows up in the Bible, it has to do with fruitfulness. It's saying this is when they died, but this is what they did. They had children. They were fruitful. And so this is a, a very interesting thing. And um, it, it happens all down through the Bible. It's amazing uh, how it comes together. And I, I don't want to bore you to death with all this, but look at chapter 9 of Genesis and look at verse 29. It's consistent. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. So nine always is showing up in the context of being fruitful. All right? Uh, look at chapter 11, verse 19. And Peleg lived after he begat Ru, uh, Rehu uh, 209 years and begat sons and daughters. The nine just keeps showing up. Everywhere you look uh, through the Bible, it shows up. Look at uh, uh, verse 24. And Nahor lived nine and 20 years. There it is. The nine shows up again. And look at chapter 19. This is kind of interesting because it puts everything that we're saying together. Chapter 19 of Genesis. And look at verse number 24. This is very interesting. Uh, I have the wrong reference. 
Uh, let me find it here. Hold on a second. It's the first mistake I've made this entire year. <laughs> uh, well, like the old fellow said, must have got that out of the Bible because it sure isn't in it, you know. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can use a cheat sheet here. Seventeen twenty four. No. Oh. See, that makes sense. I was only off one number. Seventeen twenty four. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh. Without having a child sex education class here, it's about fruitfulness. 99 when he was circumcised. Now the purpose of circumcision in the Old Testament was to separate God's people, the nation of Israel, from what was referred to as other than God's people, the heathen. <laughs> All right, Gentiles. Understand that Abraham was a Gentile before he was separated through this covenant relationship. And God made him his chosen people from the loins for the birth of his son, his only begotten son. Abraham had two children, right? Ishmael and Isaac. But Hebrews make sure that we understand that Isaac was his only begotten son. And on that note, let me just say this. It's very important that we let God's word be God's word and not change it. Because that picture of Isaac being Abraham's only begotten son is the proof text for John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. son. Are you a son of God? Am I a son of God? I mean, by my profession. No. <laughs> okay. So God has many sons, yes. but he only has one begotten son. So when someone changes that and says God one and only son, that's not biblically correct. And it messes up the entire proof system of the Bible where Scripture interprets Scripture. So we don't want to change the Bible. We want to keep the Bible as it is, okay? If you don't understand the problem of the Bible, it's like, you know, in the old days, I don't know, this is going to date me. You remember where you get the problem is not in your set? <laughs> you know, they get this picture. This dates me. I'm so sorry. Let me change the subject. Uh, <laughs> but... It would let you know that, that you, so you didn't go up there and start kicking on the console or something like this because your television wouldn't work right. It would have that message. The trouble is not in your set. Well, I want to say when we come to the Bible, the trouble is not in the Bible. Okay? The trouble is from an external source. And we want to make sure we keep the Bible. At least that's where really, every word is important in the Bible. We don't want to change it. All right? So here we're given this connection about nine being a picture in the Bible, consistent picture of fruitfulness and fruitful in redemption. It's also fruitful in the spirit. All right. Uh, look at Galatians chapter five. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to talk some more about this this morning in the church. I want you to think you went to church twice. Uh, Galatians chapter five. And in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22, we have what are called the fruit of the Spirit. Fruitfulness. Now, Rob, you're so good at math before. Can I pick on you again? <laughs> so, Galatians 5, what's that number? That's 5. Nine. And 22. Okay, 9 again. So, it's just interesting how it comes together. It's just... I, I think, you know, we think that God is great and everything like that, but we have no concept of how detail-oriented he is. And one day, 
when he changes us and we're with him and he reveals to us, we're going to go, ah, oh, the half wasn't told me. <laughs> because it will see how um, much deeper he was than we ever, ever could dig uh, to unearth the treasures. And so here we have uh, the, um, uh, even the, the chapter and verse markings that are, are consistent. And so here we have in chapter 5, verse 22, what does it say it is? But the fruit of the Spirit, and if counted, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Nine. Nine. And it's just, these are the things, um, uh, when I was first got saved, you know, I grew up in church and I learned all the stories, but I, I didn't know the Spirit of God. And it had them in my heart. And the Bible says that if you don't have the Spirit of God in your heart, the Bible's foolishness. You, you, it, it doesn't have to be disrespectful foolishness. It just doesn't make sense. And the reason is, is because the Bible begins to make sense when you have the Spirit of God inside you after you accept Christ your Savior. I don't know how many times right after I got saved, I said, Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> you know, it's like the first time my eyes were open to the truth. And I thought, I can't believe that was in there. And uh, since then, that happens on a regular basis multiple times during the week. I, in all these years, and all the reading and the study, and I still feel like I am mining for treasure every time I open the Bible. And guess what? I'm never disappointed. I always find treasure. It's a, a, a wonderful thing. Paul put it this way, how inexhaustible are his riches and his ways past finding out. I mean, it, you just cannot, you can't end it. And so we have not only the nine fruits of the Spirit, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Are you a greeter today? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we only allow people to leave that are greeters. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse number 8. We'll look down at verse 7. Um, now let's, let's look at verse 1 first. Now concerning spiritual gifts. So the Bible talks about these spiritual gifts that were given to the church, people in church. Spiritual gifts. And in verse number nine, he or verse number eight, he starts going through the gifts. <clears throat> Count them with me as I do it. For to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom, there's one. And to another the word of knowledge, two. Verse nine, to another faith. You're gonna have to count with me, I can't do all this. <laughs> and to another, I'm starting to use my toes and you know. <laughs> uh, to another, uh, the working of miracles. Oh, it's, wait a minute, I've missed. Uh, to another gifts of healing, to another miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Nine. Nine. So you have this fruit. It's all consistent through the Bible when you start looking at this. And I just want you to see that it's fruitful in the spirit. Uh, we won't go there because we have to stop for today. The preacher gets really upset if I take this service too long. Uh, <clears throat> but in Matthew chapter 5, we have what's called the Beatitudes. All right? And guess how many blessings in the Beatitudes? There's nine. Okay? And again, about being fruitful. So here's what I'm saying is once you start seeing, you get the truth that nine in the Bible pictures fruitfulness, then when you're studying out a passage, you see if there's any of this kind of stuff that confirms what you're looking at. Because it's consistent throughout the Bible. And if it isn't, then you might be going on the wrong path. If it is, you're probably going on the right path. And you keep using these principles like this grid or this filter as you're studying the Bible to make sure that you know the truth. Now, I'll just conclude by saying this. This is a Baptist church. And to a lot of people, that means a lot of different things. I don't want to upset you. I go to a Baptist church, and I have no complaints about going to a Baptist church. If I was choosing a church, that's the one I'd choose, a Baptist church. But I'm not a Baptist. 
I'm a Bible believer. Long before I become a Baptist, I become a Bible believer. Because what dictates the choices in my life are not Baptist tradition, but what dictates the choices in my life is what the Bible says. Now, this might not sound like it's a revolution, <laughs> revolutionary statement, but it is a revolutionary statement. When you separate yourself from your traditions and focus yourself to be a believer of what the Bible says, it absolutely will change your life. Because now I don't have to march to the beat of someone else's drum. I get to march to the beat of the Savior's drum. And that's what I want to be. And that's why I wouldn't be in disrespect. Was being disrespectful? Say no. No. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so, if my mom believes something different, I'd love her. But that wouldn't mean that she was right if she believed something that was wrong. Because this is the standard of what's right and wrong. Not what we believe or not what someone else believes, no matter how much allegiance or love we have. You will never, ever hear me say in this church, this is what I believe and you should all believe like me. I'll never say that. I will say this, this is what the Bible says, and we should all believe that. Because I don't want you following me. You know what the Bible says about if the blind leave the blind? They both fall in the ditch. <laughs> don't, don't, don't follow me, all right? Now, follow me as I follow Christ, but I don't want you to be, and a lot of times in churches, it just becomes this groupy thing. I, I don't want you to follow now. I want you, I want you to follow God's Word. And that's the reason we've taken this time and this study in Sunday morning uh, to go through how do, we, how do we know the truth? How do we know that what we're learning from the Bible is the truth? And these principles will help us. Well, uh, there's one more, uh, actually two more uh, things that I want to talk about on regards to the number nine, and then next week, finish that up, we'll get into number 10, which is another one of those great, wonderful, fun numbers, and hopefully you'll be able to be with us for that. We want to thank all those that are joining us online. It's a great thing. Um, I met another person this last week, um, and this time it wasn't at Walmart. But I went to an establishment to get my oil change. And the guy said, I see you every Sunday morning. And I say, you do? And uh, he said, yeah, I see you online. So, again, there's a number of uh, people out there that are listening and watching with us that we don't even know. And uh, we pray that we'll make an impact in their life for, for the Lord. Amen. So thanks so much for joining us online. And uh, uh, for you all that have been here this morning, uh, this great day to have communion today. Great fellowship time, and we're looking forward to that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the truth of your word, how it shapes our lives, gives us hope and encouragement, becomes a great comfort to us in time of stress and trouble. Father, thank you for your goodness every day, fresh and new. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much.